Hello. Good afternoon, students. We have now got introduced to Homer as an important writer of classical um, Greece. We have talked about his major epics, his major works, and also discussed epic conventions, which are common to epics in any language, in any culture. Let us now take a look at the first of his epics, the Iliad, and appreciate it as one of the most important epics of the world, the importance of which continues even today, centuries after it was composed and sung and popularized. So, introducing you to the Iliad, let me make the presentation, get the presentation ready. Yeah, so, you know, the visual representation of the, uh, these epics can be seen in the works of art. You have the, 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 the sculptures from ancient Greece sometimes cut in stone. They're known as bar-relief. Bar-relief st stands for the flat pieces of sculpture cut into the stone phases of mountains, hills, and so on. Bar-relief. It's known as bar-relief. Uh, sometimes you have it in pottery. You have the beautiful images etched or drawn on these vases, the urns, and other earthenware from ancient Greece. Um, yeah, so uh, it is from these images that we get an idea of the immensity of the action that goes into the compensation, composition of the Iliad. Iliad or the song of Ilium. Ilium is another name for Troy, the island of Troy. The Greece, uh, the you know, country of Greece is made up of many, many, many islands. It's an archipelago, a collection of islands. And um, Troy happens to be one. Uh, in ancient Greece, we know that you had these city-states, uh, states like um, Sparta, then you have Menelaus, Iona, Ion, then you have uh, Troy and so on, Ithaca. These are the various city-states. And in the Iliad, we have the action set in the city-state or the island of Troy, windy Troy. And that is how it was, you know, that is one of the stock epithets that the epic uses over and over again. We discuss that as one of the major conventions of the epic, the use of stock epithets, uh, stock phrases, and so on. And windy Troy, Troy where you have the winds howling, and um, also Troy where you have the uh, winds of battle because of this. Trojan War, which lasted for 10 long years. Now, what was the immediate um, reason for this war is something that we need to analyze. We know that, you know, the island of Troy had a long history of enmity with the remaining uh, states, uh, you know, in their fight for supremacy. Uh, battles and conflicts were very much a part of um, Greek history. At various points of time, you have uh, some city-state rising in eminence, to do which it has to fight its way through uh, to victory against the other city-states. And at one point of time, you have the ascent of Troy, and the rest of the Greeks then consolidate themselves and their powers to fight against Troy, to remove, uh, remove Troy from that seat of supremacy. So it is in that uh, history, in the, it is in that cause of history that we need to place this battle. But there was an immediate uh, reason for this battle. And that was, uh, do you know who, that, who was responsible for, the, for that battle? There is a person who is described in literature or in poetry in this manner. The face that launched a thousand ships. That is how the playwright um, Christopher Marlowe describes somebody. 
in the play Dr. Faustus, written by Christopher Marlowe, you have Dr. Faustus trading his soul with the devil in order to learn the art of black magic. And when he learns black magic, one of the first things that he does is to bring back the souls of ancient people. You know, he had a list of people from the past whom he wanted to see, to meet. And one of them is Dash, seeing whom, you know, he's stunned and he says, Dr. Foster says, was this the shape, the face that launched a thousand ships? Do you know about whom Dr. Foster said that? Obviously, it is about a very beautiful person. And who is that beautiful person? Do we have answers coming in? Let me check the chat. Yeah, Helen, Helen of Troy. Arunima and Gayatri have both answered it rightly. Helen, Helen, the beautiful Greek lady who was in fact the wife of King Menelaus of Sparta. Sparta is one of the important Greek city-states and uh, it is ruled by King Menelaus. And his wife is this beautiful Helen. And it so happened that um, King, uh, Prince Paris of Troy, Troy is ruled by King Priam, Priam and his wife Hecuba have many sons. Hector is the most important and the next in line to the rule, uh, to the throne of uh, Troy. His young brother is Paris, a very young, handsome uh, prince, Prince Paris. And Paris happens to reach the island of uh, the land of Sparta. There is a story behind that also. You know, Paris was chosen by the goddesses for a, a kind of decision to be made. You know, the goddesses like Athena, Venus, and uh, Aphrodite, and uh, who is the other one? Uh, Hera. They, they, you know, they have a conflict or they have a question to settle. Who is the most beautiful among them? And they choose Prince Paris as a mortal to decide this question. Who is the most beautiful? And each one bribes Paris in their own way. But one person says, I'll give you this. Another person says, I'll give you that. And Aphrodite, you know, the goddess of, um, you know, later we, we recognize her as a goddess of beauty. So Aphrodite bribes Prince Paris saying that, I'll give you the most beautiful woman in the world as prize if you choose me. Anganayana, Prince Paris says that Aphrodite is the most beautiful among the goddesses, for which, of course, he incurs the wrath of the others. Hera in the goddess and uh, Athena, both of them are the wrath in Katenu. And Hera is actually the patron goddess of Troy. And that is how he puts uh, Prince Paris's life and the life of the other Greek people in turmoil because she wants to protect her Troy. Anyway, he is you know, uh, destined to reach Menel, uh, the, the island of Sparta because that is where the most beautiful woman, Helen, lives. Paris, Angene, or a ship, shipwreck, Karnati, he reaches the island. And there, you know, when he is um, wounded or injured and shipwrecked, the people of the island, led by the queen, Helen, they take good care of him. He's taken to the palace and there he is tended back to life. It is in that course of events that the two of them fall uh, in love, desperately in love. Menelaus was very safely and conveniently away on some assignment because he was a Purum Yudhangalana. So he was away. And in that time, uh, Paris and Helen fell in love and they just could not be separated from each other. When Paris decided to set sail back to his home island of Troy, he made sure that Helen went with him. So Helen abduct the abduction of Helen. That is, uh, Helen, of course, willingly went with Paris and they, he takes her to Troy. And of course, the Tro Trojans are, you know, uh, many of them are scared because uh, Prince Paris has a sister named Cassandra. You know, Cassandra has been blessed by the gods with the power of prophecy. And Cassandra says, do not bring Helen here because this will lead to the destruction of Troy. But love is blind and Helen did not go back to Sparta. Paris did not want her to go back to, uh, to Sparta. 
and they lived in Troy. And in no time at all, we know that the Greeks consolidated their army. Menelaus comes back, he finds his wife missing. Naturally, he rages and he, he is very angry. He gets in touch with the others, people like his brother Agamemnon, warriors like Achilles and Odysseus, Ajax, and many others. The mightiest warriors from each one of the city-states is asked to take part in the back. And together you have this huge army moving towards the island of Troy. In the conventions, the description of the ships, naturally it would be, uh, they, they had to set sail across the ocean in order to, the Aegean Sea, in order to reach Troy. And you have a thousand ships from different parts of Greece forming the Greek army that sails towards Troy for battle. So that is how the battle starts. And it lasts for 10 whole years. And in keeping with the epic convention, what you have here is that the, you know, the beginning of the action, or the, the epic begins in medias res, in the middle of the action. As I told you, it takes us to the very end or the last year of the battle, in the 10th year. It starts with a very important turning point in the battle, and that is a kind of argument between two of the mighty warriors on the Greek side. Who are they? Agamemnon, the leader of the Greek army. Menelaus' brother Agamemnon is the captain of the Greek army. And he and the other major warrior, the mightiest of all Greek warriors, Achilles, they have, uh, you know, uh, they are not on talking terms. They are, uh, you know, um, they have some great enmity. Other, we, we need not go into the story behind that. Other Pariyantanne, you have many, many lines of the epic being used. It involves the gods and so on. You know, the supernatural presence or the divine intervention is another important epic convention. And the gods take part in the affairs of the people. These people are, of course, blessed with divine attributes as well. And uh, you, you have this, um, this tiff or, or this... Um, uh, standoffishness between uh, Agamemnon and Achilles causing a major dent in the uh, Greek army. In other words, the Greek army is on the back foot now because of this. You have the Trojans now making a lot of advance. And for a very long, uh, you know, for the, this whole um, uh, epic, the Iliad is made up of 24 books. I told you each book stands for each letter of the Greek alphabet. Alpha, beta to omega. Alpha, beta, um, uh, then you have gamma, etc. Uh, it goes up to alpha to omega. 24 letters of the Greek alphabet. Uh, for each of those letters, you have one book and it contains 15,693 lines written in a very elaborate Stand, um, so, you know, was for dactylic hexameter. Hexameter means six feet. So six into two, 12. And it is in dactyl. So it's a very, each one would be a very long line. Like iambic pentameter, dactylic hexameter is another meter. And it is the one that is normally used for uh, very grand for poetic compositions like the epic. And throughout it has a very formal rhythm which remains consistent till the end. Yeah, so these are some of the epic conventions that you see in this epic, um, right? So uh, this, you know, this 10 year battle, uh, and once you are uh, told about the background of the battle, what happens and so on, then you get to see the many characters. I've just put up on the slide, the names of only the most important characters you have hundreds of other characters. On the Greek side, you have, of course, the leader, Agamemnon, that is Menelaus's brother. Then you have the other major warriors, Achilles, Odysseus, Ajax, Ajax, and then Patroclus, who's a very close friend of Achilles. And when Achilles, because of his enmity with Agamemnon, because of his shift with Agamemnon, stays away from the battle, there is a very important section in which Patroclus is given the armor of Achilles in order to 
cheat or dupe the uh, Trojans. The Trojans would think that Achilles is back on the battlefield, seeing the armor. Actually, it is not Achilles. Patroclus Arna, Achilles in the version. That uh, armor, the helmet, then the steel um, hood, and, uh, hood and all that, you know, that very protective armor, the shield and all that. So he is the one who appears on the battlefield. And, the uh, you know, the Trojans are worried because when Achilles comes, that is trouble for the Trojans. So they were quite happy when Achilles was sulking in his tent because of his stiff with Agamemnon. And they were making a lot of progress. But now with Patroclus on the scene, the, uh, you have some of the books of the war describing that mighty battle. Like the uh, detailed description of the ships, the weapons used by these people, their characteristics, their relationship with women, with you know the women that they have left behind at home, with the gods and goddesses who bless them or sometimes are their enemies. All of these is described in great detail. Now, Patroclus is killed by Hector, Hector on the Trojans' side. And this is something that disturbs Achilles a great deal because his great friend, Patroclus, he knew, died only because the Greek, uh, the Trojans, and particularly Hector, the Trojan, Hector, the leader of the Trojan army, mistook him for Achilles. And therefore, now you have Achilles rising up in action to take revenge for the death of, for the killing of Patroclus. And the war between Achilles and Hector, the mightiest warriors on either side, that is the climactic part of this, uh, uh, this whole epic. It is described in the course of at least three of the books. And in between that also, you have a lot of other events. I'll just quickly run through the, uh, the story of the battle. That is all. Now let's take a look at the uh, Trojans, the important Trojans. Of course, the ruler is King Priam. His wife is Hecuba. They have many children. One's Hector, the mighty wa warrior, the counterpart of Achilles on the Trojan side. The daughter, Cassandra, who has the power of prophecy. Prince Paris, a young, handsome son. And then Andromache is Hector's wife. In, you know, each one of the epics has a whole lot of emotions. You have great jubilation, you have great celebration, you have intense joy and intense sorrow too. And one of the most uh, sorrowful parts of this is Andromache mourning for her husband, Hector. And then later, King Priam, the father, seeking the permission of Achilles to get Hector's body back. You know, Achilles was so uh, enraged by Hector killing Patroclus that in exactly the same manner that the Trojans had ill-treated, you know, the, the, the dead body of one of their warriors, Patroclus's body, they had not given it and they had, uh, you know, celebrated in jubilation when Patroclus died. Now, Achilles takes revenge for that and the Greeks do not give back Hector's body. It is dragged all over the battlefield tied to a carriage and in that way brutally ill-treated but Hector had a boon given by uh, a supernatural one of the gods as a result of which his body would um, you know uh, rejuvenate it would get rejuvenated whatever the damage that it suffered ultimately now you have Priam coming and seeking the mercy of the much younger Achilles requesting him to give Hector's body back so that they could conduct the funeral in a proper manner. It's one of the most moving lines of the uh, Iliad. So all, you have all the emotions, you know, the, a, a, taken to a very high peak, whether it is joy or sorrow or whatever. So these are the major characters. Yeah, so this is just in brief the story. It is covered by the nearly 10-year war with the siege of Troy by the Greek forces led by Agamemnon, who is the king of Mycenae, another of the Greek city-states. The Greeks are quarreling about whether or not to return Chryses, a Trojan captive of King Ag Agamemnon, to her father. And uh, uh, not Chryses, Bryses. Bryses is the name of the princess, a daughter of Chryses, who is a priest of Apollo. 
And when Agamemnon refuses, then you have uh, uh, Apollo, the god, coming in and threatening them with the pestilence and so on. And it is over this that you have this fight between or this uh, uh, anger between uh, Agamemnon and Achilles. So at the behest of Achilles, Agamemnon is forced to return bright, uh, that, uh, the daughter in order to appease Apollo and end the pestilence. But when Agamemnon eventually reluctantly agrees to give her back, he takes in her steed, Bryces, yeah, Achilles' own war prize. And feeling dishonored, Achilles wrathfully withdraws himself and all of his warriors. The Myrmidons are Achilles' warriors. And that is when the Greek army suffers a big setback. Then, testing the resolve of the Greeks, Agamemnon feeds a homeward order, but Odysseus encourages the Greeks to pursue the fight. And then you have uh, yeah, various, various uh, individual fights, the whole army fighting against each other, and so on. Yeah. Mm. You can read these, or you can read any good summary of the battle. We can't go into the uh, finer details of each of the 24 books. You just need to know that finally, you know, uh, the, 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 you, you have these two armies equally uh, powerful. At one point of time, it is the Greeks who get the upper hand. At the other point of your time, you have the Trojans achieving a significant victory. It goes on for 10 long years with this kind of um, swinging action, you know, uh, shifting from victory, shifting from this side to that. And finally, they decide that, you know, even the gods intervene, seeing the mortals in this kind of combat, the gods intervene. And finally, they decide that something has to be done to put the war to an end, to stop the war. And that is when they decide to come up with the idea of the horse, a wooden horse. The Greeks say that we will now go back to our own city-states. It is ceasefire. We will end the war. And in return for all the action that you have, we have engaged you in, we will give you a wooden horse. But the Trojans who made merry that night, drinking and uh, engaging in all kinds of merrymaking, when they were sleeping after all that merrymaking, out came the soldiers who were all hidden in the huge wooden horse. They came out and we know that they set fire to the island of Troy. It was, as Cassandra predicted, the destruction of Troy. And then the Greeks go back when they back with her. We will meet Helen later in the next epic that we have to discuss, that is um, uh, the Odyssey. I'll just, uh, you know, you have this beautiful 1956 movie, Helen of Troy, which is, of course, based on this, on the Iliad. Of course, with the love story in the uh, forefront. When you read the epic, it is not so much the love story, but it is the Greek ideal of honor and bravery. Helen and the love story of Helen and Paris. I just got a seven minute video which will take you to the major scenes of this movie. You can watch the movie, it will now be available on some of the film platforms that you can see. Uh, you can also watch the trailer just to get a feel of the kind of ships they use, the kind of people they're talking about, the kind of actions, and so on. I'll just show you a bit of the movie. Let me uh, close this presentation and get another presentation ready.
होप यू कैन हियर द म्यूजिक यस मैम या सो दिस इज द मैप ऑफ ग्रीस यू हैव द रीजन ऑफ ट्रॉय देयर mighty troy blessed by the gods a rich civilization this is king priam in court beside him is his wife hecuba yeah these were the kind of ships that were in use then and it is in one such that prince paris sets sail you have the greek institution of slavery the people rowing the boats the film gives us a detailed uh, look into the way these ships sail this is prince paris who is shipwrecked and reaches the island of sparta and here is the beautiful helen of troy helen actually she's helen of sparta but because you know she fell in love with the prince of troy and because of her the battle waged she's called helen of troy this is helen and her um, you know maids taking care of paris and they fall in love this i think is a uh, hector who hears about it in troy menelaus when he comes back hears about his wife's disappearance the journey back to troy an early titanic scene <laughs> helen in disguise all of this is des described in the epic only in flashback idokka sambhavichu kazhinjittaan the action of the epic begins so they are welcomed in but this is cassandra they are on the right side who warns paris and uh, helen that this should not happen and then you have the attack these people in troy watching the attack of the greek army the entire greek army these are some of the yeah these are the mighty just a few episodes from the battle this uh, trailer actually the, or this actually this is meant to highlight the music of them yeah this is the wooden horse 
this trailer does not have too many of the battle scenes, but that you can watch in the movie. They are rejoicing that the battle, 10 year battle has war, not the battle, war has come to an end. But from the wooden horse, during that night of revelry, out come the soldiers, they breach the walls of the city. The death of Prince Paris, I think, yeah. And then Helen is taken back to <laughs> Greece, to Menelaus and Sparta. Yeah, I'll stop the present. Please don't leave the meeting. Uh, because I told you at one o'clock, I'm expecting other students to join. OK. Just hang on for five minutes. Try to watch the movie to get an idea about the glory that was Greece. I think that movie actually uh, brings it into prominence. So we need to discuss this. Um, yeah, and the book, of course, the, uh, the 24th book of uh, the Iliad ends with the return of the, the funeral of Hector. It is described in great detail. All the ceremonies, you know, in, in each of the epics, again, you might have conventions like either a coronation ceremony or a battle. Or Battle will be mostly always there. Then you would have a funeral. It is through the descriptions of these that you get insights into the culture of those times. So they are indicative of the culture, the rituals, the festivities. Uh, it is when you read the Iliad that you get uh, ideas about, get an, a, a good idea about the Olympic Games. You know, the Olympic Games began uh, in ancient Greece. Um, the, uh, of course, um, before the funeral ceremony, you have these uh, people engaging in a great deal of sporting activities as a kind of salute to the dead warrior. So you get uh, an insight into the funeral rituals also. Yeah, I hope some people are joining now. Let us hope many more will join. What is the number now? We are still only at 27. Third year students, are you feeling hungry? I'll stop the recording here. <laughs>